Hi guys, and welcome back to what is surely gonna be the least watched video in a three-part series. <laughs> it is what it is. I know what you guys are gonna click on, but if you're here, good for you, because this is a really important topic to cover, and it's before we get into the actual root causes of SIBO, which I know is what you're all gonna be clicking on. But let's start with a framework first so that you know what to do with that information, right? It doesn't make a ton of sense for me to just spew out, these are the root causes of SIBO or hypothyroidism, if you don't really know what to do with that information going forward. And I find that there are some misconceptions out there in the internet and even in my field, functional medicine, when people start talking about root causes. So what do you think of when you think of a root cause? A lot of times we'll see this image of a tree and the roots and the deeper roots. And we're, we're talking about getting really down to the nitty gritty, the roots of the roots, the real thing driving your problem. But when I work with people one-on-one -on -one, and when I talk to people in FODMAP Freedom, I find that the conversation actually goes a little different of a direction. What they're looking for typically is what's called a trigger, not really a root cause. It's a type of root cause. But the way that you can think about this, of course, I'm going to draw it out for you. The way that you can think of this conversation is that you are living your life and you have a timeline that continues in that direction. So that away would be death. Over here is going to be age zero, AKA birth. Let's say you're, you're plugging along. Let's say that this is like 20 or 30 years worth of your framework here of your timeline. Let's say you're tootling along and bam, there's a point in your timeline where you were never the same since. You felt pretty okay until you took the PPI. You felt pretty okay until you had that really stressful thing happen. You were pretty okay until you got the new job and got exposed, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is what oftentimes people are after when they say that they want to know the root cause. They're really looking at what was the trigger? What was the thing that took me from being pretty okay to being pretty not okay? And that way I could avoid future triggers. And this is totally worth our while to talk about. That's what the next two videos are going to focus on almost exclusively the triggers, the things that set you off the edge of the cliff into dysfunction and take you from being pretty okay and normal to really not okay and not normal. So triggers are great, but they're not the only type of root cause, which is half the point of this whole video. So prior to this, and I'm just going to use myself as an example, just for, for the sake of being able to talk about it more conversationally. So I would say that my gut health problems really started when I was in grad school. And I think that the trigger was several fold. I think that stress being in grad school, moving to the other side of the country, living with a roommate who was a little bit slash very nutty, uh, not in a fun way, um, being in a long distance relationship with my then boyfriend, now husband, and knowing that that was just going to suck not seeing him very much. Like those I think were, were my actual triggering events. I also suspect that some of my dysbiosis got worse when I started doing a lot of elimination diets and narrowing my diet. So let's say for simplicity's sake here, let's say that the triggering things for me in my mid twenties would have been some combination of stress and a decrease in the amount of, or the variety of fiber types that I was consuming because I was doing super restricted diets and elimination diets and I went gluten-free and like I wasn't tracking any nutritional data during this time. So let's say that those were my two big triggers. So that's when things got weird. Does that mean that I was perfectly healthy prior to those things? Not really. No, like I had stuff going on. I'm pretty transparent about this. So for example, from about the age of zero up until I was probably about 23, I had truckloads and truckloads of antibiotics, which I'm just going to abbreviate because I'm lazy, tons of antibiotics. So I know darn well that I had dysbiosis from a very early age because how would I not? Um, I had ear infections. I had all sorts of problems. So I think that I had quite a lot of antibiotics and that was a big factor. Another factor probably is that nutritionally, I doubt that I was perfect. Um, I was a vegetarian from the age of 11 until I was about 22 or 23. And I really did not focus a ton on protein or iron or B vitamins or zinc. Um, honestly, I kind of rolled my eyes when people said, be mindful of your protein, because I thought, Psh, 
I'm good. I eat nuts and stuff. I'm fine. And honestly, in retrospect, I wasn't fine. I was just being kind of a jerk. So, you know, combination of, let's say, antibiotics, dysbiosis, and let's say uh, nutritional inadequacy. I'm just going to put downward arrow with newt for nutrition. Um, and also we can actually go way back to birth. Let's even add that I was a C-section baby and I was born into a family that has some celiac genes, right? So we've got some genes over here. This is very sloppy, but you're going to have to deal with it. There we go. All right, so we've got some genetic wonkiness. Don't we all have that? C-section, antibiotics, dysbiosis, iffy nutrition, and then whammo, I get to college and then grad school and I'm met with a lot of stress and I start reducing my fiber intake and my fiber varieties and things got, got squirrely. Well then, let's think moving forward. So that period of time where I had a lot of gut problems, where I was actively trying to heal, there were things that were keeping me stuck that I wasn't acknowledging. So even if we, even if we totally erase the stress, let's just, let's just get rid of that. Let's just pretend stress wasn't on the table, but it totally was. Even if stress was not on the table, stress sure as heck was on the table here as I was trying to heal. I was stressed out because I felt like my gut was never going to be better. I was stressed out because I was losing food options left and right. I was stressed out because I was studying functional medicine and I felt like I had the knowledge to fix myself, but I was not fixing myself. I was stressed out because I was spending gobs and gobs of money on Repairvite and other supplements to heal my leaky gut. I, I, I had all of these stressors from the healing journey, which I've, I have called medically induced PTSD. And I had the background amount of stress of like a roommate that didn't always get along with me great and school and long distance relationship and all of this other crap. So stress may or may not have been enough to cause my IBS, but it sure as heck was enough to keep me stuck and cause some inflammation and some dysregulation. Similarly, I never took a weekend off. I was always at a seminar or a conference every single weekend. And while I love them, in retrospect, I probably should have just like sat on the beach and got a tan every now and then. So stress is a good example of something keeping me stuck. Now I'm going to erase this framework and give you a different kind of way to wrap your head around it. And I think that it'll make even more sense when I do that. So let me just erase this real quick. And instead, we're going to picture... We're going to picture a cliff. So here we are on the cliff. Here's the edge of the cliff. And then you go off the Grand Canyon. And here we are standing on the edge of the cliff. Now in this example, feet planted firmly on the ground equals no symptoms. But if you take that same person and you go whoop, off the edge of the cliff, and now you're here, dangling by your fingernails, clinging on the edge of that cliff. Falling off the cliff in this case represents having symptoms that you don't want, whether it be migraines or pooping problems or SIBO or Hashimoto's, whatever it might be. Your symptoms that you do not want are going to be represented here. For whatever reason, our human brains are really, really good at differentiating between off the cliff versus feet solid on the ground. Symptoms, no symptoms. Symptoms, no symptoms. We can tell that reasonably well. I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of lag between when a symptom goes away and when you realize that it's gone away. But generally speaking, our brains are really well attuned to differentiating between I feel bad or I feel pretty okay. What we're lousy at, all of us unanimously, what we are lousy at is differentiating the difference between being here and being here. Right? These are two totally different scenarios, but in both scenarios, our feet are firmly planted on the ground. In this example here, the person who's right on the edge of the cliff and is kind of like, like maybe the pinky toe is over the edge and they're looking over the edge of the Grand Canyon, it would take very, very little to nudge this person off the cliff, right? Like you could just come along and go and they'll fall over. Or you could, you know, you could flick them or tickle them and they'll fall right over. So this is the person who is like, 
I was feeling better and then such and such happened. I was feeling better and then I flared. I was feeling better and then blah means that you weren't really that far away from that cliff, were you? This, this, this happens on the healing journey. There's going to be a phase of your healing journey where you toggle back and forth between these two phases where you feel pretty okay and then not pretty okay and then not. And you need to just give yourself the space to be there and slowly move away. So this scenario, again, you could go like that and flick the person off the edge of the Grand Canyon and the person's going to have symptoms. This person, by contrast, say this is like a mile away from the Grand Canyon. How much effort would it take to shove this person into the Grand Canyon? A lot. Or let's say this person is in Flagstaff, even. Like they're miles and miles away. You'd have to get in the freaking car, <laughs> drive them to the Grand Canyon. I don't know, like tie them up. We're just running with this, by the way, now. Tie them up and hurl them over the edge. It's going to take a lot of effort. And it's going to be darn near impossible to hurl this person off the edge of the Grand Canyon. This is where we want you to be. Most likely, if you're watching this video right now, you're probably on one of these two, one of these two phases of your healing journey. But the way to look at those things that keep you stuck or the things that were kind of background noise before the triggering event, like the dysbiosis, the antibiotics, the stress, the sleep, all of the stuff, the, the lack of movement, lack of exercise, frankly, all the things that are not very glamorous and not sexy that nobody really wants to give the time of day, those are the things that are going to influence your position here and here. If you are free of your SIBO symptoms, but you're sleeping like crap, your blood sugar regulation is iffy, you're super, super stressed, you're super fearful that the SIBO is going to come back and your nutrition is kind of iffy, you're going to be here. But if you could slowly start working on those root causes, again, the non-trigger root causes, you could start moving away from that position and building resiliency so that you're not so close to the threshold where you would get symptoms. You're not so close to the edge of the cliff that any little thing is going to come along and perturb you. In this scenario, you could have one bad day and be wrecked potentially for a week. You could have your boss say one crappy thing to you and then poof, you could have one lousy night of sleep and poof, you could have one sugary donut or, you know, insert name of favorite treat here. You could have one treat or one glass of wine or one cup of coffee or whatever it might be and poof, it's enough to throw you off the edge. But the goal with healing is to build resiliency and get you the heck away from the edge of that cliff so that you can have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or you could get away with having a lousy night of sleep or a bit of stress or, you know, what or lack of movement or whatever it might be. We want you to have the wiggle room so that those little things don't totally throw you off balance and nudge you over the edge of the cliff. But if you're over here, the littlest thing is going to send you right back into SIBO Never Never Land and you're going to be panicking and freaking out and wondering why on earth you haven't healed. So by all means, check out the SIBO Root Cause Guide that I've linked down below. It's got a lot of the information that we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks as well as some other uh, not uh, ancillary information on top of that. I worked really hard on this for you guys, so I hope that you love it. But go ahead and download that link. Just let me know where to send it and I'll send it to you right away. But download that, look through it, and just keep in mind that all of the things I talk about in that guide are really triggers. It's the thing that, it's the straw that broke the camel's back that threw you off the edge of the cliff, but you still want to focus on the things that will move you further away from the cliff edge. And that's going to be a lot of the lifestyle and stress kind of stuff. All of the unglamorous stuff that frankly, people in the SIBO space don't really want to pay attention to. So without further ado, thank you. I, I'm glad that you watched this video. Thank you for making it until the end. Like I said, this is going to be the least watched out of a series of three, but I thought it was important that we start with this right out the get go. I will link the SIBO root cause guide down below for your enjoyment and your benefit. I hope that it helps you in your healing journey. And as always, leave me a comment down below and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.